Um, welcome. I am Pavani Moray, and I'm the founder of Wellcilium, and we are spreading pleasure on purpose. We're helping people live their most embodied, most sovereign erotic lives through education. And this webinar that you're about to listen to is part of our free monthly webinar series. This webinar is uh, Navigating Triggers During Sex. And we asked our audiences, hey, what would you really like to have us do free, free teachings on? And um, this was one of the things that came up at the top of the list. It was like, how do you have sex when, I, how do I have sex when I get triggered? So just so you know that a lot of folks are, um, are dealing with this, right? And it's, and it's tender. So take good care of yourself during, during this. Um, there's not going to be any sales during this webinar. It's completely free. Um, it's going to be about an hour long. There is going to be a Q&A at the end. Um, and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and then I will answer them. And the, the questions are really directed at this topic of, of um, navigating triggers during sex. So just relax. Um, do take good care of yourself as this is, you know, it's a tender topic. It's, um, it's sensitive. So take good care and um, yeah, just, just know that we've got you. So what we're going to be doing today is giving you a useful tool. How do you communicate about triggers with sexual partners? We'll be giving you a helpful reframe about the purpose of triggers and a tool on how you can come back to yourself if you get triggered, when you get triggered during sex, so that it doesn't stop the experience. So just know that when we talk about this stuff, sometimes it's really present in the body. So really do attend to that. So let's start by talking about what triggers are. So triggers are body memories. They are unprocessed um, information that's stored in your tissues, in your nervous system of a moment where your system was overwhelmed and it's taken up residence. This, this, um, this residue is taken up residence in your nervous system, in your tissue, right? And then it comes up um, due to certain stimulus um, there may be associations that have been created inside of you, inside of your nervous system between certain stimuli and certain emotions or body sensations. Um, and triggers are really from the past, right? It's stuff that's left over. However, they don't know it. The trigger doesn't know that it's from the past. The trigger really thinks like, oh, this is happening right now. Um, they act like they're in the present. And so really, this is where I want to start. If, What's the most important thing you can do with your own triggers? And the most important thing is how you are with your triggers, right? Um, triggers could also be defined as unmet needs, really loud unmet needs. And so making a commitment to be kind and to be tender with yourself when you're triggered is really the most helpful thing you can do because we don't need to add um, beating ourselves up on top of, you know, or, or layering shame on top of being triggered, right? Being triggered just happens. Nobody's choosing it. It's just happening. Triggers show up in partner sex. They also can show up in solo sex. And the how of everyone's response is so important. So it's not just your response that's important. It's also how your partner or your partners respond. Um, if you're triggered or if they're triggered. Triggers can really tell us that they are bigger than us, that they are unrepairable, irrevocable, that that's just the way it is. They just define reality. Uh, they tell you that you cannot handle certain situations. Um, and this is residual overwhelm from the past, yeah? Your triggers are not bigger than you, and um, you can really learn to work with them for the sake of your own freedom. It doesn't mean that they will go away completely. It means that you lay down a second track in your nervous system. You have more choice, right? You can go to something else, um, and the trigger becomes less compelling. It becomes uh, less um, sticky, right? If you wish to do this work, right, of, of really becoming responsible for your triggers. Um, 
I think it's, I personally think it's really helpful. I have worked with my own triggers for many years. If you don't do this, right? If you're, um, if you're like, oh, I'm triggered. And so I'm just not going to do that thing. Life just starts to get really, really small. And that's just not ideal. Another way I like to talk about triggers is about being grabbed. And I actually prefer this language. So if I'm out in the world and I'm grabbed by someone, right? If someone grabs my arm, I have so many different options that are available to me. Um, and the same is true of being grabbed by triggers. They, there are many choices. And today we'll be talking about uh, some of the choices and I'll be giving you a buffet of options of what to do when you're triggered. And being grabbed, it doesn't have to mean it's the end of the sexual encounter. Um, and there's, there's a great freedom in, in it having not be the end of the encounter, right? Um, and just, you know, of course, we're, we're being kind with ourselves. It's not about like pushing ourselves through our triggers. We are meeting our triggers with the amount of resource and resilience that we have available in that moment, right? However, being triggered, it's never an excuse for bad behavior. You are always responsible for yourself, for what you say, for what you do, no matter your state of activation. Um, and this, this can be a hard sell sometimes. Um, folks don't always want to be responsible um, for their choices because it feels like it's not a choice, right? It feels like they were compelled to act in this way. And I just think if you're, if you're buying into that narrative, you're selling yourself a little short. Like um, the, the corrective here is around agency and personal agency and, um, and cultivating that relationship of personal um, power with yourself. So if you are consciously on this path of sexual healing, you are almost definitely going to be triggered at many moments right? And it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. And it doesn't mean that the healing's not happening. Um, sometimes healing feels like you're dying, right? It can feel really bad, but it doesn't mean that it, it's like, kind of like, um, is it bad? Like I am reinforcing this trauma or is it bad? Like, oh, I feel so deeply uncomfortable. And there is healing that can happen on that side of things, right? You're, it means that you're really building capacity to be with your full range of emotions, your full range of sensations inside your body. Um, in those moments when you're grabbed, you might not feel like you have choice, right? And, and you might um, do things that don't feel like choice, but that doesn't mean that it's the end of the story because there's choice in going back and repairing or inviting repair at, um, afterwards later, right? So it's not just, um, you're not just stuck with that story. So let's talk a little bit about um, avoidance. So this is a really common strategy to dealing with triggers. So if we get grabbed during sex, sometimes it seems like the best thing to do to just avoid that thing that triggers us so we don't feel like that because nobody likes feeling like it. We don't like being grabbed. And so we try to control the circumstances, the people and the situations around us so that we're never grabbed. Yeah, but this is actually unrealistic because we're going to be grabbed. And I feel like this part of doing this work consciously is around really accepting that like you are going to be grabbed, you are going to be triggered and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because every time um, one of your triggers goes off, every time you're grabbed, there is an opportunity, like it feels crappy, but there's also an opportunity to, for you to engage consciously with your own healing, depending on the amount of resource that you have available, right? And if you decide that you're never going to be triggered, right? I'm just going to live a life that I'm never triggered. Um, you're just really missing all kinds of opportunities for your own healing and your own liberation. Um, and so, and I get it, right? We want to feel safe. And so in trying to make ourselves feel safe, we can avoid the people, places, things that um, trigger us. And this is an aversion. Right. Um, and it makes sense on that surface level, but the deeper unintended consequences can be quite high. So when you are making um, that choice that you, um, you can't handle the, the sensations or the emotions that uh, you feel in your body when you're in that particular situation, when you're making that, um, 
when you're cutting yourself off from sex or from feelings of pleasure or eroticism or uh, masturbation, you're really also cutting yourself off from uh, sensual aliveness, from the feeling of life in your body, um, from uh, something that can be deeply nourishing um, and, and maybe even your creativity, your self-expression. And if, if that, um, if your life has gotten really small because of that, like, it's okay, you can go the other way. You can figure this out in a different way to be. Um, but I, I'm just here to say that you are strong enough and you are resilient enough. Like often we're so afraid of the feelings but like, hey, you already, like whatever created that whole situation, you already survived that, right? And so um, becoming more facile with your own emotions and your own sensations and really developing that deep capacity for all of you, that all the parts of you get to belong um, is where the healing's at. So wanting to speak now a little bit about what triggers can look like. And this may sound familiar to you. So I'm going to um, talk about a made-up person, Jolene. And um, this comes from a composite of many different folks that I've worked with who have sexual trauma. So Jolene is a survivor of sexual violence. And um, she came to me because whenever she has sex with her partner, she finds herself crying in the middle of the experience. And um, it it's messy and unpleasant and it often ends the experience and um so when we slow it down what she's noticing is that first she starts to feel a tension building up in her body and um it feels kind of like a like a, a slight contracting on the midline she notices that her uh her pc muscles are kind of on alert there's um there's a, a tension that she's feeling and an alertness that she's feeling in a, um, a kind of buzzy quality. And she doesn't think that this is very sexy. She has a lot of judgment about this set of sensations. And so she doesn't say anything um, because she doesn't want to interrupt the experience. She doesn't want to impact her partner. She doesn't actually, she feels embarrassed about it. She doesn't want to name it. So she just tries to keep going. Next thing that she notices is that she's starting to check out right? She's starting to dissociate. Um, and if her partner notices that, right, that she's not so present and names it, says, hey, what's going on? I noticed it. What happens is she gets mad. And, um, and then she often will lash out at her partner and try to make it her partner's fault, right? Well, you didn't do this, blah, blah, blah. You're not, blah, 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 right? Whatever it is. Uh, but the anger isn't very long lasting. Um, then she dissolves into tears uh, and that's the end of the experience. And while her partner is very patient, uh, they're also at a loss for what to do in this situation because it, it, they feel really powerless. Um, this experience is so common and, or some variation different, the variables and the sensations and the emotions and the order might be different, but this is so common. Um, and when this kind of dynamic happens on repeat, of course, the sexual connection is going to be impacted, both like the, the Jolene's sense of herself, her partner's sense of themselves, the sexual connection between them. It just, it has impact, right? And often folks um, who have triggers during sex feel really ashamed about impacting their partner. And uh, we're going to talk in a little bit about how to deal with sharing, talking about it, but um, it's like we impact each other. It's just part of the thing, right? Um, and it's part of what we show up for when we're showing up for sexual intimacy is that we are going to be impacted and we are going to create impact, right? And we want to be as mindful and responsible with that as possible, but like we're not perfect and we're, both of us in that situation are healing, right? Because in the, the larger context of the culture that we live in, everyone is doing sexual healing work, yeah? So Triggers can show up as sensations in the body and also emotions. And some common things that come up for folks um, during sex include fear, uh, anger, rage, uh, betrayal, panic, terror, longing, sadness, uh, grief, shame, judgment, um, extreme body self-consciousness, um, 
distraction. Those, those are some things and there's others. Um, the sensations that can show up include tightness or constriction, contraction, restriction, shallowness of breath, uh, pulling in on the midline, um, curling the, uh, the upper body in, going more towards a fetal position, um, shivering, changes in body temperature, numbness, um, yeah, any of those are different sensations. Sometimes there's like um, more feelings of movement, like uh, a buzziness or a tingling or a prickly or an itchy, um, tickly, uncomfortable. Those are all sensations that can show up. So let's talk a little bit about how do you know when you're triggered? I mean, you probably, when you think about it, you can be like, oh yeah, I was definitely triggered in that moment. Um, but really noticing when you are triggered is half of the battle, right? Because it is often such a quick unconscious process that if we can catch it and we can be like, oh my gosh, something's happening. This developing the skill of noticing that you're triggered, like as you're leading up to it, right when it's happening or right after it's happening or at any point in the process is just so helpful to be like, oh, I'm triggered. And to be able to name that to yourself, like, oh, this is triggered. Um, you notice that you're triggered because you have a sudden change in affect, your, your quality of beingness, of presence, of aliveness, uh, your emotional state quickly changes, your sensations change, um, your level of presence and um, being there, your level of pleasure, maybe suddenly you feel lonely, um, disconnected, scared, or you just have a feeling, um, sometimes quiet, triggers can be kind of quiet, like something's just not right, something's off. So that, those are things to track for, right, internally in your own experience. And um, at this point, like especially with the quieter ones, folks can tend to want to push through. And I actually don't recommend that. Um, we're going to talk about what to do instead. Um, but when we're triggered, there are often some um, unconscious choices that are being made. So, uh, and that means we're not conscious of them. We're not consciously making these choices. These are, these are things that can happen uh, unconsciously if we're triggered. So one is that we dissociate, we check out, we remove our attention from the situation. Um, and this is a really useful strategy if we're enduring something, if we're in a situation that is overwhelming to our system that we're not enjoying, um, just like removing our attention, like exit the scene, dissociation is a, is a very um, helpful strategy. However, uh, just like anything else, it can get habituated, right? It can get to the point where uh, I'm not um, needing it right? It's just kind of like my habit. It's just what happens. Like my genitals get touched, I dissociate, right? And um, it's not that there's an active threat or an overwhelm in that moment. It's just that's kind of the, the process. Um, folks feel bad sometimes about dissociating, right? They have shame about it. So one thing you can explore is how. How do you actually do it? Like, just get curious about it. How do I actually remove my attention from here to there? Where do I go? Where do I put my attention? Um, and with that level of curiosity, if you know how you get dissociated or how you actually do it, and then like, how do I bring it back? Right? And this, um, the skill of being able to move attention at will, this for me is freedom. This is erotic freedom, right? And so, uh, there are moments where it's completely appropriate to dissociate and there's moments where you don't want to dissociate. Right. And so having that choice there of like, how do I do it? How do I bring myself back and then playing with it? Right. Like I am going to dissociate to 3% or 30%. I'm going to get 30% more present, you know, this um, navigating that, that space in between those two states inside. Yeah. is one thing to play with. Um, we're not going to do that today, but um, just to mention that that's like a thing that could happen. You could do that. Another unconscious choice that happens when we're triggered is that we blame, right? We make it someone else's fault that we're feeling the way that we're feeling. They did this. They did that. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. They're breathing. They're moaning. Their erotic energy is interfering with my own, right? We, we blame. It's not pretty. 
but most of us do it at some point, right? Um, and then another unconscious choice is this avoidance of just like, I'm going to turn my attention away from, I am going to just absence my attention. I am going to avoid that thing, right? And um, so, yeah, that happens unconsciously. We're going to talk here in a second about uh, what to do with conscious choice or kind of like what are the conscious choices that we can make. Um, so when you are triggered, what should you do, right? So creating a and practicing a plan, a trigger plan ahead of time is really, really, really helpful. I learned this from Stacey Haynes. And so if you have a trigger plan in place, you just follow the steps of your plan. You don't have to, because like when you're in trigger brain, you can't really think very well, right? So you make your trigger, your trigger plan, your, your plan for what to do when you're not triggered, right? And you write it down and you have it near your bed. Maybe you share it with your partner or partners. Um, so the first thing is kind of like a pre-step is making sure that you have, if you're going to do this conscious sexual healing work, you're going to need a support system. You're going to need uh, a coach or a therapist. You're going to need a good friend, maybe your partner, you know, you're going to need people that you can actually talk about these experiences with. Um, so that's kind of the pre underlying um, of the plan. Like you have people. Um, so for your plan, let's talk about some steps. So the first thing is notice I'm triggered, right? And I notice I'm actually quite good at noticing that I'm triggered, right? Because I've done it so many times and, and, and this could be you, right? Of that you know what it is to be triggered. You know what the sensations are. You know what the emotions are. You know what happens with your breath. You're like, oh, every time I have that like butt clench, uh-oh feeling, I know that that's a sign that I'm triggered, right? And, and it's really my premise that uh, most of us are, are grabbed or activated like a lot of the time. I mean, just look at the comments in any Facebook feed, right? Um, that is not a well-resourced, grounded, untriggered person making that rageful comment, right? Um, and so this is happening all the time. Like when we're on the highway and we get angry at someone, we're triggered. Like that's, we're grabbed. Like there's a, there's a somatic grab, the, the contraction, the sensations, the emotions, the breathing, right? So noticing you're triggered is always step one. Like this is what is, I am grabbed. Yeah. So step two then, because when that happens, things can start to feel like they're going really fast. Um, is to stop and assess like, oh, I am triggered. I'm going to just take a pause here and take a breath. Or I'm going to notice like, oh, what are all these sensations and emotions that are flying around in my body? Like a, like a cloud of um, insane pigeons, right? Swirling around in the city. Like, whoo. Okay. So step one, notice that you're triggered. Step two, stop and assess. Step three is choose. So in a minute here, I'm going to give you some conscious choices about what to do when you are triggered. Um, step four is to engage and to communicate, right? So often we are, uh, we get triggered and then we like just stop communicating. We stop engaging and it's like some people um, go super inward or shut down or just like pretend it's not happening. So actually like this is revolutionary to say, Hey partner, I'm triggered right now. Right. And we're going to talk about how to do that because it's sometimes hard with words in a minute. And then step five is repeat as often as necessary. Right. So notice you're triggered, stop and assess, choose a conscious way to engage with your trigger, engage and communicate about it and repeat if necessary. So that's, those are the five parts of your plan and you have that written down. And um, yeah, so let's, um, let's talk about some of these conscious choices. Like, oh my gosh, I could actually work with my triggers. Yes, you can. So um, one thing you can do is go towards your trigger. I know it's, Surprising, isn't it? Like, whoa, why would I want to do that? Well, because you want to get curious, right? Um, and, and so if you are, because we're, we're always trying to like go away from our triggers, right? Make it stop. 
So like, what happens if you turn towards it and move towards it? What happens if you lean in to the trigger, to the sensations, to the emotions? Um, if you're with a partner um, and you want to choose this one, like really make sure that your partner consents, right? Just be like, oh, I'm triggered. I want to lean in. Are you on board? You know, and this is something that you can talk about ahead of time. Um, if you choose this, this is, I started with an intense one. If you choose this, you want to, like the intention of doing that is to move it towards completion, right? Because remembering that why it's there in the first place is some unmet need or unresolved um, overwhelm. And so if you choose this, you're wanting to move it towards completion and you want to go really gently, right? Like this is never about pushing yourself. This is about exploration. It's about curiosity and gentleness. Um, if you suddenly have a memory come up um, of something that was hard in the past. Um, so as I said before, triggers want us to disconnect, right? It's, it's a disconnect from the present. It's a disconnect from the situation. So whatever you're doing to stay connected is going to be uh, medicine. Yeah. And so if a memory comes up, share it out loud. And um, if you can, maintain as much eye contact as possible, right? So that your social activation systems are still engaged. Um, so that's one choice. Another one is to um, watch it. Like it's, it's almost like this is a little bit dissociated, but it's also like a little bit like mindful witness self of like watching it from a distance. Like, oh, that's interesting. Look at what's happening right now. Look at what my body is doing. Look at how my body is breathing. Uh, look at what my body is feeling, right? So you are staying in the present and almost like with some like a little bit of um, scientific distance, you're just watching. Instead of, uh, it's almost like you get a little bit of a break of, of believing it's real, right? You're just like, oh, that's interesting. I'm watching that thing happen. I'm, I, that's, that's very familiar. I know how that thing happens. And um, there's just some spaciousness there. One of my favorite ways um, is to move large muscles. Um, so especially if you have like a fight impulse, like if you notice that blame thing, or if you have a flea impulse and you want to get out of there, um, is get up and move. Move your large muscles, especially the muscles of your legs and your hands, right? Um, this really helps set you free. You can, um, you can shake Right, and if you haven't uh, checked out David Bercelli's trauma releasing exercises, you can check it out on YouTube. Um, but like shaking your muscles, like running actually in place, running out of the room, like whatever, uh, pushing against something, um, those are all good ways to physically engage with a trigger. Another conscious choice that you can make is to um, engage with your trigger like you would if it was a little child right, of, of just being really kind and really sweet and like, oh, sweetheart, what, what's going on? What do you need right now? What's up? Can I offer you some comfort? Um, and that's one way you can help to take these unmet needs and move them towards completion. Um, something else that's really powerful is to just change your sexual activity. Um, the one of the ways, if, you're, if your partner's up for it, and if you've talked about it ahead of time and you've practiced it ahead of time, one of the things that your partner can do is uh, hold the erotic bass note. So this requires really excellent boundaries and a little bit of distancing um, on the sake of your partner. To, like, so if you get triggered and you're like, ah, I'm triggered, um, your partner can be like, cool, cool, you're triggered. Like, I hear you. Like, I'm just going to stay here in my own erotic self, and I'm going to be present for you, but I'm, um, I'm going to hold this threat for us, you know, and I'm not going to push you in any direction, but just like, no, like, I'm really staying with my own sense of eros right now, my own pleasure, right? So it's like, um, they don't get grabbed. They make a choice to not get grabbed with you because like, ugh, like the co-grab is terrible, right? We all know how that goes. So this, yeah, this is really powerful when we can just change sexual activities or our partner can hold it and then come back 
right? We come back to the sexual encounter because that tells um, our system like, oh, it's okay. Like that can happen and I can handle it, right? And again, these are choices. None of them are shoulds. There's no ones that are better than other ones, right? It's just, these are menu options for you if you want to consciously engage with your triggers. Um, something else you can do is you can just take a break, right? Take a break and stay connected. Stay connected to yourself, to your body, to your partner if they're there or if you have a partner there. Um, really just like staying connected, like taking a break. I'm just going to, just give me five, right? Um, you can choose to return to the present moment. This works better um, when the triggers are a little milder, right? So you can focus on your breath. You can also just, um, I learned this from Peter Levine, somatic experiencing, like this thing called orienting, where you're just looking around your space and you're taking in the shapes and the colors. You're just saying them in your head, like a oh, rectangle brown, corner gold, ceiling white you know you're just allowing your eyes to go where they want to go and you're orienting yourself to the space that you're in and you can also orient yourself to the time that you're in like uh it's thursday it's the morning i'm breathing i'm in my room you know you can do that kind of thing too of orienting um if you sometimes we run into triggers that are like it's like a tornado um, and we just weren't expecting it at all. Maybe it's a new one, right? Maybe you're in this, some new level of healing and processing um, and that maybe you just get kind of like bowled over by it. Um, one of the things we can do is allow something bigger than us to hold it, right? Because like we're often trying to hold that energy in our own bodies. I have found it personally very helpful to go um, to the ocean uh, or out into the woods and allow something that's bigger than me to help me hold it. Let life help you hold it, right? You don't have to hold the whole thing. And when it's really bad, like that's so definitely uh, a great way to go. It's just allowing the river of life, the flow of life to help you hold it. Um, lastly, I just want to mention that if you, uh, triggers can also be habituated, right? I think I mentioned that before, but if you've already done a lot of work with a trigger and then like, oh my gosh, here it is again, right? You can actually say no. You can set a boundary with your triggers, right? And, and you don't do this right out. You have to you know, do work with it, obviously, but just being like, nope, I'm not going to do that. I am going down this road, right? So that is the, the uh, even um, more advanced level to the choice practice. Like, I am not going to engage with you you get to have your needs met and I am not going to engage with you, right? So those are some conscious choices for that um, step three of choosing what to do. So let's talk about um, step four, engaging and communicating. So um, let's say you have picked one of these strategies, these choices, and you're, you're doing it. You want to tell, if you're with somebody, you want to tell them what's going on, right? Um, when we're in trigger brain, it's hard to access our words. So um, one of the things that I often recommend to folks is a tap out, which is just three taps on the shoulder of the other person. Just like, let them know you like, and that's the, you've already set this up ahead of time. Obviously that's the signal. I need a break. If you feel like you are starting to approach a danger zone, um, you can have safe words. And, and a lot of people use um, green, yellow, red as to indicate kind of like where they are. Like yellow is definitely like, well, okay, go slower, hold on for a second. And red is stop, right? And, and if you can access words. So those are two ways you can, one is verbal, one is nonverbal, communicate when you're getting triggered to a partner. Um, when your words are there, you can then uh, communicate, like, I'm making this choice from my menu of choices. Um, and if they are there, they can engage with you. Talking about it ahead of time is so useful, right? So how are you talking about your own healing process? Um, you want to talk about it ahead of time, not in the moment, right? Um, you want to share your plan. You want to get consent. And one of the things that I think is also really important is a commitment of 
of all parties involved, you and any partners that you have, um, is tracking for presence. And this agreement that, hey, we're not going to have sex if one of us isn't present, right? And if, you know, if I notice that I'm not present, I'm going to tap out. If I notice that you're not present, I'm going to tap out, right? If I need to check in and make sure you're present, I'm going to tap out. Like tapping out can just be like the pause button of like being like, okay, cool. Let's, let's have a check in real quick. Okay. And it doesn't have to mean the end of the, the end of the thing. Yeah. In terms of healing, um, and I know I'm moving quickly through this, so do please feel free to type any questions into the, into the chat box and I'll answer them at the end. In terms of healing, um, really the more you reclaim your own experience and your own body and inhabit your own body, the less control external forces and external situations will have over you. Uh, we heal for the sake of our own freedom, right? Um, and for the sake of, of justice happening. Um, I'm going to say more about that in a sec. We often have turned from our feelings because we're scared of them. They feel like too much. Um, and you've probably heard the phrase, you've got to feel it to heal it, right? It's true. Um, and again, in your own time, in your own way, with lots of resource and support, you get to do this. It's, a, uh, it's actually an honor to get to turn towards our healing. Yeah. Um, it's an honoring of ourselves and the life that lives within us. Like, oh yeah, I deserve this. I get to heal. I get to be well. Um, and this turning towards our own experience instead of away from our own experience is profound, right? Um, it can be really scary to do this. And so I want to talk a little bit about feelings and emotions. So one of the cool things about them is that they have, an emotion has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's, a, it's actually a chemical reaction that's happening in your body, right? Um, is how a feeling is created. Sometimes it's partnered with um, some internal contractions of muscles or release of muscles uh, and different sensations. So um, a feeling has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And with the harder feelings that come up during sex, um, the goal is always to resolve the feeling, right? To let it resolve. Like you don't have to actually do anything. It will resolve. But there are um, practices and tools to help it resolve. you know, really having the, um, the emotional flexibility to be with all of our feelings and sensations. For me, this is what healing is, right? Like I'm not scared of any part of myself. I'm not scared of any part of my experience. Like I welcome all of me, everything that happened to me, happened to me, all of the parts of me get to belong. Um, and so that emotional flexibility to know that like those feelings can come up, they can come up really strongly and they can move out and they can move through. And I'm not stuck in any kind of emotional response. I'm responsive to what's alive in the moment. Right. Um, and so some of the feelings that, you know, can be harder for folks are anger. Um, and when anger comes up, it's often about uh, boundaries and needing to restate boundaries or have a boundary um, uh, put into place. And anger can really help us in reclaiming our own dignity, right? Because suddenly I am worthy of saying that boundary. Like, and the anger can help us do that. Rage uh, is something else that can come up. Um, when turning towards, right? And often folks are so scared, like, oh my gosh, if I go into this at all, like it's going to be, like I'm going to open that genie bottle and it's like going to be this unending flood of just rage or just anger or just sorrow or like I'm never going to be done. And so finding titrated ways to express can be really helpful. But rage is important because rage is the appropriate response to powerlessness, right? And powerlessness is the thing that... Um, that we really don't want to feel. And so I mean, one, 
way to go about that is to get really facile with powerlessness, right? And um, I feel like 12-step programs often are really good at supporting this practice. But rage is also really helpful, that fight response, right? That really extreme anger. Um, it can be expressed and it can be expressed safely and it can be really helpful um, to have it expressed the catharsis piece, right? Because sometimes you've, you've probably come into contact with folks who are like, just like so into being cathartic and expressing their rage. That it can be helpful up to a point, right? Because we can also get a little addicted to it, um, to this like that. I have to have this really big, powerful release of experience. That's the thing, right? I have so much of that inside me. I just need to. And what's happening there is it's not the, um, the emotion's never getting to complete. It's never getting to resolve. And it's not, when I say complete and resolve, I don't mean like, oh, good, done with that one. It's like, no, that can come up again. But um, the, in my experience, like the, uh, the experience of moving through an emotion, of allowing it to have that start, have that middle, have um, that ending, that closing, right? Just that's where that flexibility comes in. And um, so if you find that you're just like always needing to yell and scream and rage, um, but you don't feel like you're actually making any progress in your healing, what might be missing is completion and integration, right? So um, one way to do that is to have the catharsis and then, or like if you're, you know, beating on the pillow, whatever you're doing to get the rage out of your body. Um, I like to use those medicine balls at the gym and like smash them on the floor and I smash uh, the patriarchy and I smash white supremacy. The thing here is to consciously imagine the healing. So like do it, have the experience in your body of it, and then like be like, okay, now I'm going to take this moment to allow that to complete and to really feel that healing integrate in my body. Right? So you're not just stuck endlessly in that cycle. Underneath um, anger and rage are often uh, grief and loss. And um, curious if when you when you hear that, do you have a preference for anger or for grief? Go ahead, actually, go ahead and type it into the chat box so I can see. Preference for grief or for anger? Okay, a couple folks are grief. Great. So people are kind of, um, this kind of looks like it's half and half split. Um, you know, often we, uh, we like one of these feelings better. It feels safer to feel that feeling better. Um, and sometimes we feel one in order to not feel the other, right? Like we're always in our grief, right? Or we're always in our anger and because we don't want to feel the other. But both of those feelings are actually really, really vital for our, uh, in our entire wellness. Um, and so just really finding that facility, right, in, in all of that. Um, so I want to reach you something. I want to talk a little bit more about um, healing. Uh, and then we'll move into the Q&A. But I want to read to you something I wrote about my own healing. I will never live in a body untouched by sexual violence. No matter how much healing I do, no matter how much I practice embodiment, practice erotic liberation, practice boundaries and consent, I will never, never live in a body that has not endured things no body should have to endure. Justice is not some state that can be cosmically, karmically achieved. It's not legal punishment for perpetrators. It's not retribution. It's not forgiveness, nor denial, nor being competent in spite of my past. And yet I'm clear that there is no justice without healing and no healing without justice. Right, and so these choices to engage with our triggers, this choice to engage with our own healing is a choice for justice. And I don't mean justice 
in some legal sense at all. I mean, justice for each of us. Like, how do I define justice in this body, right? And for me, how I define it is I get to be here. I get to be here. And I get to be well in all the ways. And for me, that feels like justice, right? Like the, the forces that came and acted upon my body um, aren't winning, right? And so for me, this conscious engagement with triggers means that I'm fighting for my own justice. I'm an agent in my own justice. I am an agent in my own wellness. And it's really saying like, yeah, all those forces of, um, you know, abuse and misogyny and patriarchy and like uh, perpetration, like you don't win. Like you don't win. Like I'm winning. <laughs> I am winning. So, um, you know, for me, that's the, for the sake of what, why I engage with, uh, why I engage with these triggers um, consciously and work with them. And it's, you know, it's always a work in progress. It's never, uh, it's never like, I'll just be done with this work sometimes, like, because new ones come up or, you know, um, sometimes we, our resources are less. And so then, you know, it's, we're more apt to be triggered when we're less resourced. Right. Um, but you get to do this work and you get to be well in all the ways and you get to be here. So um, what I want to do is invite you right now to um, put your questions into the, the question box um, so that I can answer them for you. So let's see. Gabrielle writes, you mentioned having conversations prior to sex so that folks can be on the same page. How do we navigate when this happens with folks we may not be emotionally connected to? What about when we aren't close enough to disclose? Yeah, this is, uh, this is great. Um, this is such a great question because like, it's true um, that sometimes, you know, I don't want to, it's not, sometimes I don't want to, disclose as, um, and sometimes I'm just like, Ugh, really, do I have to like, again, you know, um, and I guess like my answer would be, what's the cost and what's the benefit, right? Like, am I going to be able to be present in the situation um, and have benefit from the situation? Or um, is it going to cost me more to not give some kind of heads up, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really personal decision of like what's going to be um, what's going to be most healing for you. And I think also like there is like it sucks, but we also do have a responsibility to not pass our harm around, right? And um, if I know that I um, I get triggered frequently during sex, like I want to be mindful of that and and um, not shame myself about it, but also just be responsible and, and let folks know so that they have a chance to um, be in conscious consent. And I feel like so many people will be, right? So many people are, they're like, oh, totally, you know? And so maybe it's something like, um, I don't want to go super deep into this and just want to let you know that um, I have some triggers around sex. These are the things that I know about it. These are the ways I'm going to take care of myself. Any questions? You know, and then just like really holding that boundary of like, I'm not going to go into what happens, right? So let's see. Any other questions here? Okay. Um, yes, the webinar will is recorded and will be um, available. You'll get the download link tomorrow. That's to Michael. Okay. Justin, I don't dissociate during sex. I can have full-on seizures. These increase in intensity with the close, the closer the relationship. I don't want to just stick to casual sexual relationships. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean seizures. I think are that's it's it's beyond right. And I'm is it? I guess I don't have really enough information to answer this question. But um, let me just listen in for a sec. Yeah, there's something here about slowness um, around moving really slowly and um, with lots of check-ins. And I wonder if that might be, might be of use here. 
Um, you can't even feel the trigger coming on. Yeah. And so like, I just, I wonder if like um, what it would be like to explore that of like where, uh, you know, kind of like, because like what I, it sounds like vasovagaling to me. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know, but it sounds like um, the nervous system has a response where the, where you pass out. Um, and so it's like, where's the window of tolerance? You know, where is uh, it possible to, um, be present and stay conscious and like kind of what there, there probably are signs, even if they're subtle, like maybe it's like a, um, a tingling in the extremities or, um, I don't know. Um, but I think if you ex do some experimenting, you might get some more subtle sensations that could help cue you. And then, um, obviously like letting your partners know that, um, that you're working with that. I actually have worked with somebody who had a similar, had something similar happen of like when they got aroused, uh, they would pass out. Um, so it's definitely a thing. And um, yeah, just lots of care about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. Is healing sexual trauma possible with a partner who is part of the traumatizing, but has done lots of their own healing in and out of the relationship? You know, I think sexual healing sexual trauma is an inside job, right? Like it's it's something we do for ourselves and with ourselves and our partners can be really supportive and they can hold um, a really compassionate witness space, but the healing work is ours to do. Um, it sounds like there is like the trauma healing work, I mean. Um, in this situation that you're referencing, uh, what I imagine is that there could be um, like relational trauma healing that would happen through this. Um, and, and it could be. And I imagine that um, there's going to be, a, it's going to take time, right, for the trust to be built because we're constantly in that process of rebuilding trust with our own bodies, right, as we're doing this, that we're listening, that we're being responsive. And, um, and I think when there's another person engaged, if there has been uh, the sexual harm that's happened either intentionally or, or unintentionally, I think intentionally, it would be really hard. Unintentionally, uh, you know, we hurt each other sometimes unintentionally. And so I think in that case, like, yes, that that could definitely happen. Um, but just like to really be clear that like, because like, you don't want to give up the um, ownership over your sexual healing either. Like you get to like, be like, I'm doing this. You know, this is mine because it's, it's such a um, blessing. Yeah. Okay. How can you support partner when the trigger happens post orgasm? Yes. Um, this is really a great question because it, it does, right? So when, like, it's interesting because the cycles of our triggers are actually quite similar to this, the orgasmic cycle, right? And so often when the body releases and has an orgasm, like there can often be, um, there's a, there's, there's a vulnerability in the system, right? And triggers can often present. Um, and sometimes, especially if uh, pleasure, like orgasm and pleasure got wired um, with trauma. Um, and so someone might have some traumatic release uh, or they might, um, you know, it's, it's pretty common for folks to have like a sobbing. Sometimes folks go into kind of a freeze response after orgasm. And so, you know, in this, in this case, I would um, I would want to do work with the partner to um, to to slowly build to orgasm, to really check in, eye contact, like, are you ready? You know, you might get triggered. Are you ready for that? You know, just like really have a very slow time of it. Um, and then have a plan in place for like, what do they want? Do they want to be held? Do they want a blanket? Do they want um, just some body space of... Um, you know, and then I personally would want their agreement that if they're getting triggered after orgasm, that they are uh, intending to work with that trigger, right? That they are making a conscious choice and that they have their trigger plan and they have some choices and these things, right? So that, um, so it doesn't become that you're the person who triggered them and therefore replicated harm. Yeah. So I, you know, personally would just want to have those things in place for myself. Yeah. Hope that's helpful. 
Anything else that folks want to ask about? Let's see. <laughs> crygasm. Yes, I love crygasms. All right. Um, hold on one sec. You spoke so beautifully about being a powerful and present partner during triggers. Any offerings of how to be that skill of holding space? How to even talk about that as an erotic skill? And how does that relate to ongoing enthusiastic consent? Yeah, this is a great question as well. Um, so if you are the partner of somebody who has, has triggers during sex, which probably is all of us, right? Um, even if we're not sure of it. Um, how to hold that space. Um, yeah, I mean, tenderly. Um, again, having make, making sure ahead of time that there's, you know, if, if it's on repeat, if it's like, if it's a trigger that somebody's like actively working with, you know, having a conversation ahead of time of like, what do they need? Um, the, the thing about triggers is like, can you just allow someone to have the experience in the space that they're having without taking it on, without making it your fault, without having to fix it, just like, and without like losing that connection to yourself, like without leaning in too far or leaning back too much, right? It's, and I mean that kind of metaphorically, um, of really just like being like, oh, this is happening for you. Like I'm, I'm here, I'm loving, I'm quiet. Let me know if you need anything. Um, oh, I just noticed I'm hungry. I'm going to go get a snack. Do you want a snack? Okay. You know, I think it's like, I like to say sometimes that in, in my life, trauma is spelled with a lowercase t, right? It's like, I'm not, um, I don't want to be overly obliging to a traumatic response um, in myself or in someone else, but I don't want to ignore it either. Just like kindness. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's good. Um, how does it relate to the ongoing enthusiastic consent conversations? Absolutely. Like if you're not into doing this, like if you're not into the holding the space, uh, I think that that's a conversation that needs to happen, right? You might not have the capacity you might um, in that moment or at all. Um, and I think if it's, if that is true, if somebody is experiencing a lot of triggers and you don't have the, the bandwidth for it, like that's fine. It just might be that you're not compatible sexually right now, right? Like they might need to have other partners or be a partner with themselves, or you might need to just not be their partner and they can do them, right? Like you might not um, be the person to help them with that. Yeah. Can you explain more about how you can lean into the trigger with an intense visual flashback? Can you give an example of how you could play it out in your mind or change it or change the brain channel or whatnot? Yeah, totally. Um, one technique that, um, that I found really helpful is to project it onto a screen. Like, so if it's just kind of like in the visual field, um, to imagine narrowing it so that I'm watching it, like holding my cell phone, right? So it's just like, I can still see it, and I can see what's happening, um, but it's not taking up, I don't, I'm not giving it space to take up the whole field. Um, and so if it, especially, this is really important with traumatic memory too, of um, that when we are, uh, when we're leaning into it, hold on, let me make sure I'm getting the words right. Yeah, when we're leaning into um, something that's like a traumatic memory, that um, we're holding an anchor in the present, right? Because like those intense um, intrusive thoughts is, is another word for them. Um, they can come up and they can just like fill the whole space with their reality, right? And so it's like, how do I be like, and touchstone right shoulder or touchstone bedside stand or um, that there's some tether so that um, I am actively participating uh, in taking care of myself while it's happening. This is, um, you know, it's something to practice. Sometimes you'll get it, sometimes you won't, but in, and it's not like a failure, but it's like, this is something that can happen when those intrusive thoughts come in and just like, if you have something that you grab for, um, whether it's something that you wear in your body or whether it's a word or whether it's your partner's hand or whether it's a part of your own body or whether it's like, when this happens, I take a breath. Like if you have those things already in place, it can just be really helpful in like in being that tether to the present moment and to the reality. Yeah. 
Cool. Anything else, folks? How to support without coddling and treating partner like a broken toy. <laughs> yeah, I think I answered that one. Um, okay, and this one, if if they're like, it's okay, keep going, and then you're, their system's freaking out, or if your system's freaking out in response, you're like, mm, nope, uh-uh, they're saying okay, but I'm uh-uh. Like, follow your uh-uh, right? Follow your no. Um, and, uh, you know, here's the thing. It's like, trauma wants to convince all of us that we're broken all the time. And like, there has to be some degree with which we hold that with a little bit of levity, right? A little bit of, oh, sweetheart, you know, oh, sweetie. Um, like, I'm the adult here. You know, I see that you're having a real hard time and I'm the adult and like, it's okay. It's just a feeling. Right. It's just a feeling because it's like whatever happened already happens. And so we're just trying to like catch up. Our bodies are trying to catch up so that we can feel safe and we can feel trusting and love. So good. Well, thanks everybody for showing up and for the really great questions. Um, so we, uh, well, Cilium offers a free webinar every month. Uh, it's usually the first Thursday of the month. The next one's going to be April 2nd and it's called loving without losing yourself, uh, which I know is also a common topic in relationships of like, how do I love you and love myself and not get all mush mush, right? How do I not merge um, too much? Um, and how do I stay connected at the same time? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And you can register for that on wellcilium.org, W-E-L-L-C-E-L-I-U-M.org. If this was helpful for you, I'd love to hear from you about it. I'd love to hear what um, practices, what choices um, sounded really good to you. Um, also, like what would be really awesome if this was great and you were super into it in, is to follow us on Wellcilium and share our stuff. We're really trying to spread the word. So that is, um, that's a way you can give back to, to us and to me. So thank you, everybody. I am Dr. Pavani Murray for Wellcilium, and I wish you so much breath and pleasure. Bye.